Hi everyone and welcome to the <coughs> phonetics lecture on manners of articulation. So in the last two lectures we looked at kind of the basics of phonetics and a few of the <coughs> organs that we use to produce these sounds um, and also what types of sounds happen at each part of the mouth. So in this part we'll be looking at manners of articulation. So despite having limited uh, parts of the mouth to produce sounds in, we can still produce quite a few different types of sounds. So in English, the sounds that we probably see the most often in terms of consonants are what's called stops, fricatives, affricates, and approximants. These are all the different types of manners of articulation. Uh, so basically what that means is even though a sound might be made at the same part of the mouth as another sound, there's going to be maybe a different type of constriction of the airflow through the mouth at that point. So basically stops are, you know, going to be the most constricted type of sound. Approximants will be the least constricted type of sound. And keep in mind, this is just in terms of consonants. We'll look at vowels kind of separately a little bit later, but uh, for Consonants for manners of articulation, we'll be looking at these four types for the most part. So <clears throat> stops in English are the most constricted type of sound that we'll be looking at. Stops result from a full closure of the oral tract. So um, there's kind of oral stops, nasal stops, and as we mentioned before, there are also voiced stops and voiceless stops. And then the stops will also, can also be described by the place in the mouth they occurred at. So for example, the P sound, usually represented by the letter P, is going to be a voiceless bilabial stop. Um, we usually, when we're talking about these sounds, uh, leave out the oral description for the oral sounds. Uh, that's just because sounds are generally considered to be oral by default, and we only need to bring in another word to describe them really when they're not in that default state of the airflow going through the mouth. So, for example, when we're talking about the nasal, the nasal stops, m, n, and n, we will call those nasal stops because the airflow is going kind of through the nasal cavities rather than primarily through the mouth, um, although it is still going through the mouth too. So basically these um, nasal stops are going to be called nasal because they have airflow going through the nose as opposed to just through the mouth. So the oral stops or just kind of the stops in general are going to be p, t, k, b, d, and g in English. The nasal stops will be m, n, and n in English. So when you say these stops, um, there will at some point be a complete constriction of airflow through the mouth. So at some point when you say each of these sounds, there is no air actually going through the mouth, and then it's kind of released in a sudden burst. Fricatives are still pretty constricted in terms of airflow, but not so tightly constricted that no air can escape through the mouth. So with stops, we had full constriction of the airflow at some point in the sound. With fricatives, there is a lot of constriction but not full, uh, not full closure of the airflow. So in English, uh, the main fricatives that we'll be looking at are f and v. So these are the labiodental fricatives um, made with the teeth and the lips together. One thing about fricatives that you may notice um, if you try to say them continuously, you can actually hold a fricative for an extended amount of time. This doesn't really work with a stop because when airflow is stopped, we're not hearing any sound. 
But with fricatives, there is actually continuous airflow despite being so constricted. So because there's that continuous airflow, we can actually say these sounds continuously. So for example, you can say and just hold that F sound for quite a long time, as long as your lungs are going to hold out. You can say S for a long time. You can say shh for a long time, like, you know, shushing someone for being too loud, that kind of thing. So with these fricatives, you can actually hold the sound continuously. So in English, the fricatives will be F and V. And then we have the two different types of kind of TH sounds in English. We have the TH voiceless and the TH voiced. We have S and Z. And then we have SH and Z. So these are the main fricatives in English. We also have what's called an affricate. So this is kind of a combination of a stop and a fricative. So there actually is a stop when we have an affricate. But right after the stop, there's a fricative. So really, these are kind of two sounds that happen really close together. Uh, although, for whatever reason, kind of convention at this point, with these sounds, you'll frequently see them described as an affricate rather than the two separate sounds that they really are. So um, when we start kind of looking at how we're going to describe these sounds in a technical manner, um, then we will, uh, then you'll kind of see what we mean by this is two different sounds um, just described as one sound. But for example, with jug and chug, if you say them very slowly, uh, you might be able to notice at this point that, for example, jug is kind of a d sound, like the letter d, followed by a j sound, like in rouge. So it's something like d jug if you say it really slowly. Um, but when we're talking normally, it sounds like one sound, just like jug. Same with chug. It's kind of like a t sound with a t, followed by a sh, sh, in really close succession. So t shug, if you say it really slowly and exaggeratedly. Um, but these are the affricates, basically a stop with a fricative following it really, really closely. So English also has what's called approximants. Approximants have a very small narrowing of the vocal tract, but this isn't really enough to cause a complete obstruction or to cause too much, um, too much noise. Like with fricatives, we had a lot of kind of turbulence in the air because the air is getting forced through a really small opening. Approximants have a small narrowing of the vocal tract, but not a whole lot. So approximants, we have in English what are called liquids. So liquids, you can kind of think of them as uh, sounds that are formed or sounds that kind of sound like the letter L. Uh, basically, liquids have quite a lot of airflow, um, but they are kind of one solid sound as opposed to glides that also have quite a lot of airflow, but the sound kind of changes a bit as we say it with glides. So liquids have a lot of airflow, but stay pretty much the same as we say them. So we can say l for l, or r for r, so the l and the r sound. Um, glides, it's kind of hard to hold a y or a w, and you may notice how much those sounds kind of change as we say them. So these approximants in English are always going to be voiced. So these will not be voiceless. Your vocal cords will always be vibrating when you say these sounds. So I've been using the term stops and fricatives and affricates for these consonants. Um, you may hear other terms for these. Um, and I'm kind of uh, showing you what these terms might be. So sometimes stops, fricatives, and affricates are all referred to as obstruents. That's because they're really obstructing the airflow in the mouth quite a bit. 
Liquids, nasals, and glides are frequently referred to as sonorants. Um, this is because they can kind of be said continuously. You don't necessarily have to completely stop the airflow through the vocal tract for these sounds. Um, you can really hold these sounds continuously quite well. So kind of like with fricatives, but with liquids, nasals, and glides, um, they're referred to as sonorants just because there's not really a whole lot of constriction of airflow. Um, so liquids and glides, there's really next to no constriction of airflow, uh, just kind of reshaping of it with the tongue. And then with nasals, there is constriction through the mouth, but there's very free airflow through the nasal passages. So before we move on to the next section, I have a quick question for you to kind of think about. Um, so when we've been looking at the sounds so far, um, we've kind of looked at them as what letter usually represents these sounds. And in some cases, like with the TH sound, we have two different sounds represented by the same two letters. So we've also had instances of different sounds being represented by the same letter with something like the letter G can represent G as in game, or it can represent J as in rouge. So we kind of have a mismatch in some cases with letters to sounds. So uh, the question I have for you is, um, basically, what do you think of the current English spelling system? Um, do you think maybe we should stop using it, switch to a phonetically based system, maybe where each sound is represented by one letter and every letter is pronounced, there's no silent letters? Um, so what might be the advantages and disadvantages of each approach? Um, <coughs> so um, basically, this is just kind of a question to get you thinking about the topic in the next lecture, which is going to be something called the International Phonetic Alphabet. So the next lecture, we'll be looking at how linguists actually represent sounds when they're talking about them in research or te technical papers and things like that. Uh, so um, you can kind of think about this question for a little bit, maybe review the manners of articulation, and hopefully join me for the next lecture at your leisure.